Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Logistics Executive TV. Uh, today, we're specialising in the area of uh, sustainability, in a particular area of sustainability. I'm joined today by a gentleman I'm proud to say I've known for well over a decade. Uh, he is a senior executive, uh, not only in the broader supply chain, logistics space, maritime, land logistics, but in the last decade or so, very much in the sustainability space, and in particular, in the fuel area. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Gary Hubbard. Gary, how are you going? Thanks, Kim. You make me sound old, but uh, 10 years <laughs> has never passed so so quickly. But no, good, good to, to be here. Yeah, good to see you, my friend. And uh, it's good to see some of your uh, your uh, triggers up on uh, up on LinkedIn recently about some of the developments in the fuel industry. You are currently the chief uh, chief, or you're the vice president of commercial and operations for the biofuel company in Saudi Arabia. So maybe if you can give us a bit of a heads up in the last decade, that movement and that specialisation that you've gone into into green energy, sustainability, and then a little bit about. Uh, biofuels and what's happening in the kingdom at the moment yeah it's our pleasure it's um yeah it's been an excellent journey you know if i look back over you know my career as you quite rightly touched on i i've spent most of it you know creating some of these uh, these fossil challenges we have around the world with you know global international supply chains with dhl with the likes of ap Moll and musk um and then, yeah, you know, a few years ago, I, I think we probably get to a certain age where we think, well, actually, what can we do for the next generation? What can we do to help um, ratify some of these these challenges? So, um, yeah, I moved into the into the biofuel sector. Um, and then two years ago, we opened up the, uh, the first and currently the only uh, biofuel uh, refinery in Saudi Arabia. So okay. based over on the eastern province, uh, based in Jabal. Uh, under the auspices of, uh, of the Royal Commission there and Saudi Aramco, um, we collect uh, waste from the kingdom and we refine it into biodiesel, which is a direct replacement for fossil diesel. Um, it goes in power generation, it goes into uh, fleet, into logistics fleet, it goes into marine vessels. So it's, yep. it's an exciting place to be. It's, uh, as you know, the kingdom has changed a great deal over the last 10 years. Um, totally. And out of many places I've had the uh, the great privilege to work in, I have to say, this is one of the most exciting right here, right now. Exactly. So, and it doesn't surprise me, to be frank, that you're involved in, in biofuel because you've always been in the, as long as I've known you, you've always been in the cutting edge of what's happening next, in specifically in the logistics, both from the maritime and the land logistics side. So now you're covering multimodal transport. Uh, tell us, tell us where Jabal is for those who uh, are not are not familiar with the kingdom. Yeah, it's it's the eastern side of uh, of the kingdom. So we're just above Daman. It's uh, the natural habitat of, of Saudi Aramco. It's one of the largest uh, petrochemical uh, hubs in the world. Um, so if you're in Bahrain, you skip across the causeway and you arrive on the eastern province where we are. Um, kind of you to say so. I think you know when you're when you're a natural logistician, you're always looking for efficiency. You're always looking for leanness. You're always looking to take redundancy out of supply chains. You know, be it in cost, be it in transit, be it in resources. And I think now, certainly over the last sort of five or six years, that those disciplines are exactly the same for the environment. You know, if you've got a lean, cost-effective, efficient supply chain, you're not needlessly wasting um, resources. You're not needlessly burning fossil fuels in the most part, and therefore you're saving the environment. You yeah. get to put that sort of logic and that ability together with an environmental product such as a biofuel uh, diesel replacement, and you've really got a winning formula. Uh, and I'm pleased to say, you know, many, many of the the blue chip organisations across the kingdom have recognised that, um, and you know, we're pleased to welcome those our clients. Well, sustainability is a massive part of the uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia's 2030 vision. Maybe you can uh, let us know, let the audience know a little bit about 2030 vision for a minute or so, and then how sustainability plays into that and where the biofuel company fits in. Yeah, you know, I think the vision is is fantastic. Um, you know, if you if you ever have the time to sit and read the full vision, you'll see it's built on several pillars. 
two of the pillars that are most relevant to this discussion. One is logistics um, and two is environment. You know, Saudi are, are pushing heavily, investing in their infrastructure. They've got their own shipping line now. Folk Maritime came on stream earlier this year um, to be the logistics hub for the region, to take some of the crown from, uh, from the likes of the UAE um, and to literally be that central point, bringing it in from North America, bringing it in from Asia um, and then distributing it across uh, the GCC effectively. So, you know, the, the pillars of 2030 is all about having a very modern, a very positive, a very proactive supply chain infrastructure for the kingdom, but not only for the kingdom, but for the neighbouring states. To do that, not only have you got to you know, get the best talent in, uh, which is clearly important, um, but you've got to invest in modern technology, you've got to invest in modern fuels. So being part of that strategy, being supported by uh, what they call the PIF, um, offering biofuels to not only the logistics uh, networks, the logistics clients, but also the maritime clients, the port infrastructures, and not forgetting the massive giga projects with their own infrastructure, with their own ports, with their own logistics networks. That's like putting two, um, you know, two bees in a honey pot and they're making very happy and very productive honey from it. So yeah. it's a, yeah, as I say, exciting, innovative, all the things that we all want to do. Well, I suppose also the fact that um, the fact that it's mandated as part of part of the 2030 vision. Uh, I mean, the entire country takes that vision very, very seriously. Um, I was in um, I was in King Abdullah Economic City yesterday, and uh, for for an event there that we had a business breakfast, and you know. The, it's existential. The 2030 vision is part of everything that's going on, both from an investment and construction perspective, from the infrastructure, logistics, supply chain, uh, transport, everything that you look at is is it's got to be linked into that 2030 yeah. vision. Which you, you know, when you when you look at a, a country as big as Saudi Arabia, um, you know, it's got certain advantages to it. And of course, and you're in the background, um, in the, in the backyard of the world's biggest company being Aramco. Yeah, very much so. And I think, you know, if you've ever worked, as we all have, for, for large organisations, they can be very dysfunctional, they can be very silo orientated. And what you will always try to do is to drive change by addressing the culture of those organisations. Now, this mm -hmm. is exactly the same, but on a country scale. Yeah, the Saudi 2030 vision is a cultural change driven, you know, by the people, for the people, with the people. Um, yeah. It's a sort of, or it's achieving it, the sort of recognition, as you quite rightly explained, uh, and, the, yeah. and the kudos and the, the support from literally industry, from, um, you know, from, the, from the, the man on the street, from the school child, everybody is, is learning and understanding that this is all about their future and the vision yeah. is at be focused on their future yeah. for a greener, cleaner um, environment for everybody who lives there and works there. Yeah. Now, I know you travel globally in regards to, you know, the sustainability of the fuel sector and speak a lot. And I'm just about to invite you to speak at an event in Jeddah in a couple of, <laughs> couple of months after this. Um, where is where is Saudi, uh, for example, and I know UAE also very big on sustainability. Um, where, where are they in terms of, you know, on the curve of development for in your space and biofuels uh, compared to the rest of the world? I mean, you're you miles behind Europe or you're about on par or how's it placed? It's a really interesting one. Um, you know, the, 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 you can look at the maritime industry and you can recognise that fuel is bunkered in Rotterdam, it's bunkered in Singapore, it's bunkered in Fujairah. They're the top three global hubs. You know, you look at the road networks, you can look at North America's road network, you can look at Asia's network, you can look at intermodality across Europe. You know, Saudi's building that infrastructure, it's building its intermodality, which is, again, you know, the more efficient way you can transport goods, be it on rail, um, then the better it is for, for everybody. But what, is, as I said earlier, is that they're, they're making the investment into new technologies. So for the environment, there is no silver bullet. No silver bullets at all. Mm -hmm. It's a mix. You know, wind turbines plays a portion of it. Solar plays a significant portion of it. Water generated power plays a portion of it. LNG, um, you know, hydrogen, the list goes on. 
us in our small corner of, of the biofuel industry, we're an instant fix. There's no capital investment. There's no infrastructure um, costs required for it. It's a literal drop in fuel and you switch one day uh, to it from the next day. So the impact for that is immediate. I think it demonstrates that the kingdom is not just theoretical. It's not spending 25 years planning a business that it will then try to instigate. It's literally got its vision. It brought the vision to the table. It got approval across the kingdom and it does it. Having worked in Europe, North America and Asia, um, it's kind of what Asia used to be like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where a good idea was enough to get it over the line and make things happen. <laughs> Europe and North America, you know, you, th yeah. there's an element of red tape there. There's a, a significant element of legislation. Um, and don't forget, you know, they're, they're democracies um, for all the sins that that brings with it, but it stifles yeah. change. And if the change is positive, as it is in, in the kingdom, um, then change should come quickly with the support of the people. And that's where we are with 2030. So it's difficult to compare because I think they're in a different state of development, but certainly mm -hmm. the pace of change is exponential. Right, as with many things uh, in, the, in the Gulf at this, this stage of the game. Um, and of course, you've got a lot of feedstock in terms of projects because you've got globally significant projects in terms of size, scale, shape, and investment. You've got NEON, uh, which has uh, got a massive sustainability pillar to the whole thing, um, which is one of the biggest um, residential and industrial developments globally, anywhere on the Red Sea, uh, not far from where I was yesterday. Um, you've got the line, which is, you know, again, a spe spectacular project, getting a lot of attention. Again, got to be completely uh, CO2 negative, all of these projects, as yep. I understand it. And you and I were talking off camera just before about the Red Sea development yep. um, with a colleague of ours running things up there. Shout out to Michael Stockdale, who's who's <laughs> heading up all the logistics and supply chain on the Red Sea uh, project up there. Um, I don't know how many resorts, probably dozens of resorts, uh, tens of thousands of rooms. So uh, in all that area, and it's all got to be carbon neutral. Yeah, it has. And I think it's also developed into sport. You know, I'm, I'm a, a big, I'm going to call, I'm going to call it football because I'm British. So I'm a big football fan. And, and obviously the kingdom has, has managed to entice many footballers from around the world to come and join the teams. The events that they're hosting are carbon neutral. They're hosting fantastic concerts now with some of the greatest names in music across the world. And I was lucky enough to go to a couple last year where we provided the fuel for the power generation. They've got the Formula One in Jeddah, which is a fantastic event. The Formula E in Diria, which I would say is even better. Um, mm -hmm. And again, EV, you know, it has a place in our world. And seeing those cars race around the track, you know, and again, you know, we're providing the, the, the biofuel for all of the services, the, the heating, the lighting, the cooling. Um, but just seeing those race around the historic UNESCO city of Diria is just absolutely fantastic and you don't get to see things like that around the world very often at all so it's spread you know beyond hospitality it's spread into the F&B markets it's spread into that the you know the cultural markets it, it's a really interesting place to be right now brilliant Gary fantastic to talk to you I appreciate you sharing some insights with us I'm sure our audiences uh, will be in interested in hearing uh, more as things progress and the industry develops so from you and the uh, in the Gulf, uh, just up the road from Qatar, not far from Bahrain and uh, adjacent to the world's biggest company, Aramco, uh, there you are with the biofuel company in Saudi Arabia. Uh, really look forward to catching up again. Uh, Gary, where can people get hold of you if they uh, want to have got any inquiries, uh, any information that they need? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, we're ready available on LinkedIn. We're ready available via our corporate website at biofuel.sa. Um, the team are there just waiting to support the next environmental initiative. So thanks, Kim. It's been a real pleasure today. Awesome. Brilliant, Gary. Yeah, that information is now downstairs here. So uh, all the best. I will look forward to catching up for, uh, for a milkshake with you soon. And uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Perfect. Have a great weekend. Cheers, uh, cheers, Gary, and thanks everybody for joining us on Logistics Executive TV.